الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Okay um, Remember earlier when I told you there are no hard and fast rules in da'wah I lied There are <laughs> There are two rules I call them the golden rules And what we say Like all the things all the techniques They're really suggestions When I say this is a technique It's a suggested technique it's not necessarily going to work. And I pick my technique based on a lot of things. Remember that chart that had the rabbi, the Buddhist, that had all these people? I pick my technique based on the individual. And if I know the individual well, then I'll base it on uh, their personality, personality type, uh, my relationship with them, who they think of, what they think of me. Maybe they just, you know, you're their friend from high school. Maybe you're the younger brother. Maybe you're the son or the daughter, and they're the parent. All these things come into play. And people always want me to tell them how to deal with their family. You can't do that. Well, uh, what should I tell my mom? I don't know your mom. I don't know your relationship with your mother. I don't know how big, how deep this problem is. You have to find the problem. Remember what we said yesterday? You, like, you diagnose, you find the problem, you apply a solution. That's your job. You always have to diagnose. Many times someone will come to me and say, look at this, look, just... I want you to focus on how illogical this question is. Someone will come to me and say, my mother, I reverted alhamdulillah five years ago, my mother is still non-Muslim, and she never, ever allows me to talk to her about religion. If I even mention religion or hint, she will stop me and cut me off. This is the question now. How can I talk to my mother about religion? What am I supposed to tell him or her? Yeah, but that's not talking to her about religion. Maybe eventually, you're right. I, mean, I might practice and she might say, well, you know, this is interesting and you've become very well-mannered. and That's true. But how do I get her to talk about... Do you see? Talk on the phone in front of her? Mm -hmm. so you explain? Okay, and he tells you she won't let me. Anytime I try to talk about religion, she will stop me. How can I talk to her? How can I talk to her about religion? Write a letter? Yes? Sorry? In their dawah, like the phone. Is that talking to her about religion? Nah. Tell someone she respects? Have someone that she respects? Tell her. Okay. Now tie her up, exactly. You tie her up. Yeah. How else are you going to make her listen? You tie her up like this so she can't block her ears. Tell her, listen, mom. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Obey your parents. <laughs> okay. Zakal khair, Sheikh Walid. Okay. Here's another scenario. My sister doesn't wear hijab. And every time I try to talk to her about hijab, she stops me. How can I talk to her about hijab? Okay, I, I already told you in the beginning, the question, there's something wrong with it. The question is, how can I talk to her about hijab? But I already explained to you, she never lets me talk to her about hijab. My mother will never tolerate talking about religion. How can I talk to her about religion? Do you see something wrong with this question? If she won't talk to you about religion, why would you ask me, how can I talk to her about religion? She won't let you talk to her about religion. So what would you do? No, besides that. No? Talk to her about something else, right? And it makes sense. For the hijab, for example. What I've heard from others, don't speak to them about hijab, but speak to them about other matters, being or something else. Salah, maybe. Maybe she prays. Increase their iman and their guidance, right? So the one, the mother was half public, but. The hijab is easier. If they only have to speak to them, yes. Okay. All right, but you, yes, sir. You ask her why, what makes her stop engaging in that, in that particular topic? What stops her? You're a genius. <laughs> You're a genius, Zakallah Khair. May Allah increase you in intelligence. And everyone else is intelligent, but he just got it. You find out why she doesn't want to talk to you about hijab. You find out why your mother doesn't want to talk about Islam. That's the solution. So this is how it works. You come and you sit next to her. How are you doing, mom? How was your day? 
listen, I'm not sitting with you right now to talk to you about religion. I'm not going to say a word about religion. I just want to ask you one question. Why do you hate to talk about religion so much? So you understand me, mom? We're not going to have a religious conversation now. I'm just, I just want to know why you hate the subject so much. Faddali. And then she'll tell you, and there's your solution. Find the solution in her answer. I'm, I don't want to talk to you or preach to you about hijab. I just want to know, why do you hate the subject so much? I mean, in the end, you know, something in the religion of Allah, you want to do it or not. I don't want to find out. I'm not going to try to convince you. I just want to know why you hate the subject so much. That's all. You understand? Then you can find out why she doesn't want to talk about religion and, and fix it. What if your mother says, oh, you know, talk about religion always brings fights. That's it? That's your only concern? Yes. Okay, then we're going to talk with respect and I swear we're not going to fight. And the minute you're uncomfortable, tell me to stop. You see how now we can find, and you, you can identify the problem and offer solutions to it. And if someone doesn't want you to, you need to find out why. I can't find a solution. I'll, I'll just come with the, with the phone and start talking. Right, they get up and walk away. Now what? You're going to follow them around the house. So I was telling you. <laughs> like, why are you coming in my bedroom? Yeah, I, I have a phone conversation. You need to hear. Ah. Huh. So find out why they don't want to talk about religion. Find out why they don't want to talk about hijab. Find out why your friend, every time you bring up Islam, he'll move a subject to something else. And so on and so forth. Yeah? So... <laughs> That's a very important thing. And many times people come and say, uh, what can I say to my mother? Uh, first of all, I don't know what to tell you to say, say, to say to your mother. What's your relationship with your mother? Oh, I haven't been speaking for two years. See, I need to know details. And I don't know her personality type. I don't know all this stuff. You have to sit and formulate a da'wah plan. That's why the, when those who did the Shahada course, we, did, and we had something called the, the da'wah worksheet. Whoever's on your, the top of your da'wah list, we made a worksheet. This worksheet analyzes their personality type, what they, kind of, what they like, the kind of arguments that appeal to them, all kinds of issues, background, history, everything you take into consideration. And then I come up with the perfect plan and I present it. And I'm still making du'a for that individual. Yeah? You cannot never ask a stranger, what should I tell my dad? He doesn't know your dad. He doesn't know your relationship with your dad. He doesn't know the age of your dad, the educational level of your dad. Never. You formulate your own plan. All right? So, um, so what was I, uh, what, what got me into this to begin with? Um, yeah, the golden rule. So we'll get to the golden rule. Yeah. But, oh, or some people will come and say, um, my mother is a non-Muslim. What can I tell her? She's a Christian. Okay. Uh, there's a great book. Uh, give it to her. Yeah, I gave her that book, actually. Mm. There's a very nice lecture on YouTube. Yes, we watched it together. Okay. Read all the ayat about Isa ibn Maryam in the Quran. Yeah, uh, we did that. Okay. Show her the verses in the Bible that show, say he's a prophet and not a God. Yeah, we did that also. What does this guy want from me? I know, I'm serious. This is what he wants. He wants me to do this. Okay, look, I don't tell this to everybody, but go home and say this to her. Some magical thing, magic wand. And we always say in da'wah, there is no magic wand. He, he wants me to say something so powerful, he's going to go home and just drop it on her and she'll say the shahada. And then he said, an email, Sakallah khair, it worked. And I'll tell him, of course it worked. It's a, it's a secret weapon. There's no secret weapon. There's no magic wand. If there was ever a magic wand, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have used it with Abu Talib. Yeah? So there isn't. And if the Prophet didn't have it, you don't have it, I don't have it, no one has it. You just persist, you keep doing it, you keep doing your job over and over again. Just like the Prophet called Abu Talib over and over and over again. Every time you can try different technique, different angle. One time you leave a book on the table, one time you leave the CD about Salah in his car. When he starts it, he hears it, whatever. Yeah? Anyways, the golden rules. So we said, these are the only rules that we insist upon. Where are they? Everything else is a suggestion. Everything else, you feel it out. You see, you know, what can I do with this individual based on what I know of them, my relationship with them, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> the golden rule number one is go for the gold. And go for the gold means ask them for the shahada. And you have to do that. You have to. So, meaning, when do you have to do that? When I convince someone, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, they have no problem with the five pillars, what's next? What's next? 
And why did you get them exactly? Why did you get them to this point if you're not going to ask for the shahada? It's ridiculous to not ask for the shahada. I'm sorry. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never ever in the seerah went to a group of people to call them to Islam and he got there and didn't call them to Islam. Even the sentence doesn't make sense. He just went there and then didn't call them to Islam. But he went there to call them to Islam. If, you, if you're calling people to Allah, call them to Allah. Ask them to become Muslim. Let me tell you, this rule... Uh, when, I, when, it be, when I learned it, the difference between knowing this rule and not knowing it, an effectiveness. And I mean, an effective da'ya can speak to people and he can affect change. But a successful da'ya can affect change, do the follow-up, and these people start to pray and they're part of the community. That's a successful da'ya. So I'm not talking about success now, I'm talking about effectiveness. I used to stand in front of a store and stop people. A Muslim owned the store, so I'd stop them. So I have a five-minute int introduction to Islam. I'll give them the five-minute introduction. I'd memorized it and everything, prepared it, repaired it, and you know, practiced it. And then when we're done with the five minutes, I would just stand there looking at them and they'd look back at me. And there would be a strange silence. And it looked like this. And they'd just keep looking at me like, and what? I listened to your five minutes, now what? I thought if I explain Islam in five minutes very nicely, they will beg me to let them become Muslim. Because it's a great religion and it's logical and all that. Yeah? But that's not the case. You need to ask them to become Muslim. When I learned the golden rule, the difference was I would stand in front of that store weekend after weekend, zero shahadas, effectiveness, I'm not saying, huh? Then when I learned the rule, five a day was the difference. Just from this one rule. You can, okay, let's, let me give you a, a scenario like this. I'm inviting someone to my house. The edge of the stage there, that's my house, okay? So I'm inviting someone to my house. I, want to, I meet him, I want to invite you to my house. And on the way, I'm telling them about my house. My house is great. It has fantastic, uh, you know, marble. The windows are excellent. The doors came from I don't know where. We've got rugs from Persia. And just, I'm telling him about how great my house is. <laughs> then, this is the house right here. When we, he comes with me all the way to the door of the house, I step inside. Well, it was very nice talking to you. And I close the door in his face. Did I invite him to my house? Okay, let me change the story now. Um, I'm here inviting people to Islam. Let me talk to you about Islam. Islam is over there. Islam is fantastic. It will make your life better. You will love it when you become Muslim. You'll be better with people. You'll have a connection with Allah. It was so nice talking to you about Islam. And now, please leave. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing, isn't it? If this is Islam, I have to invite him to it. If I'm inviting him to my house, I have to say, come in. It is absolutely a waste of time to say to talk to someone and get them to accept La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and five pillars. Everything else is okay. Any problem? Do you have anything to stop you? Nothing. Okay, it was nice talking to you. Imagine you worked at a car dealership. I always use the example because America it's a car dealership, every corner, selling cars, cars. I mean, maybe there can be a better example for for Malaysia. I just don't know what it is, but just let's just humor me with the cars. So. The guy works at a car dealership, and the guy comes, you know, I like this car. I want to test drive it. Okay, fantastic. They get in, they test drive it, tell them all the features, this, 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 and that. The guy's like, I really love this car. It's fantastic. I, it, I agree with the price. I agree with everything about this car. Well, it was very nice, uh, and I enjoyed the test drive with you. What would your boss do to you? He'll fire you on the spot. <laughs> on the spot, he'll fire you. Why on earth, if he liked the car and he agreed with it and everything, why didn't you sell it to him? They did a study one time. And they studied sales that don't go through. In America, they always try to study ways to separate you from your money. Yeah? So they studied, yeah, yeah they put billions of, yeah, they, they, <laughs> the retail industry is something else. So they, uh, they studied why the sales that didn't go through. Let's say we sell this much. And this many sales failed. And they studied them and found out that 96% of the time, when a sale didn't go through, there's only one reason, 96% of the time. The salesman didn't ask for the sale. Now, the, the rest of the 4% had a thousand and one different excuses. It was the wrong size, it was too big, it was the wrong color, they accept cash only, I had a credit card. I th can you imagine, a thousand excuses are crammed into the 4%, but 96% of the time, the salesman didn't ask for the sale. So you have to ask for the shahada. 
otherwise you just you're just some crazy person who likes to bring people close and then close the door in their face uh, you see how close i got him i like <laughs> very strange yani so you have to ask for the jihad you have to i follow this rule so much that sometimes i know the guy is not going to become muslim i still ask for the jihad because what happens mentally when you tell someone become muslim now in their mind they become they become convinced that they need to become muslim yeah they become convinced that okay one one guy he kept telling me once i just i just need to everything you said makes sense i just need to flip through the quran with my hands just like this that's it i'm not going to become muslim without touching that quran and just looking through it a little bit for a few minutes but otherwise i'm convinced send me a cup of quran so i still asked him for the shahada so in his mind he was convinced i need to become muslim just or but blank 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 as soon as i blank 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 I'll become Muslim. It's in there. Yeah. So go for the gold. Any question about the golden rule? One, let me clarify something. When do I ask for this, for the shahada? When someone agrees, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. I explained the five pillars. I said any problems, any issues. By the way, when you explain the pillars, you, you can, the pillars can be explained in 45 seconds. Yeah. Because you already focus on, on the, the first. La ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah, then you're just doing the rest. Salah, you explain it quickly. Hajj, Zakah, Ramadan, makes sense, makes sense. Any problems here? Okay then. Then right now you have the ingredients to become a Muslim, become a Muslim right now. If the guy says no, what do you do? Now he's talking to you. Find out why. You're not being pushy, you're being very polite. Uh, you know, as you say here, sorry sir. I <laughs> you know? You're Malaysian, be Malaysian. Sorry, sir, I just want to know why you don't want to become Muslim. You, you, <laughs> you already agree. Yani, you basically, yeah? yeah? Here's a book for you to read, two hands, yeah? All this sweet stuff that you guys do, take advantage of it for dawah, yeah? So, say, <coughs> so basically, okay, I, we just agreed on everything, and basically you have the ingredients to become Muslim right now. What is stopping you? We find out very nicely what's stopping you from becoming Muslim. They'll tell you why, then give them a solution for it, and then what do you do after that? Ask for the shahada again, because sometimes people have more than one problem. If there's a second, fix it too. How many times did someone tell us, oh, um, my mother won't be happy? It's okay, you talk to your mother. We talk to your mother. You start to put the foundation, lay the foundation so we could, your mother will accept it. Or become Muslim, don't tell her until she's ready to accept it. All these solutions, yeah? There's one guy, many, many, many times people will say, oh, I love uh, beer too much. I love beer with dinner. I can never become Muslim. I agree with everything you said, but I love beer. Or I love, many times also, pork, yeah? Oh, I, I agree with everything you said and it makes sense, I just, I love pork too much. When people say that to us, we use one technique only with them. We shame them out of it. Shame them out of it. So Allah gave you all these blessings and so many blessings that you cannot count them. Your health, can you put a price on that? Your eyesight, can you put a price on that? Your intelligence, your ability to reason, your family, your loved ones, your job, your provision. Allah has been so good to you. And He gave you so many different kinds of things to eat. From the oceans and the seas, so many different kinds of fish and different kinds of animals you can eat. And from so many different kinds of drinks and juices and so many kinds of meat that are permissible. So you're telling me you're going to ignore all the blessings He's given you. All the other sources of food. And you can go sometimes without eating. And it's been done up to from 30 to 40 days a human being can go without any food. On these extreme conditions. Three days without any drink. And you're telling me you were going to leave tr believing in your Lord and worshiping Him because you love pork. Wallah, every time, every time we do that, the, the person is doing this. No, 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 of course, I was just joking. Let's, let's do it. And they, <laughs> I'm serious. And they take their shahada. Well, that, you know, you focus on the drink for the guy who says the beer. And they say, oh, no, I was kidding. Of course, I can leave it. Let's, t let's do it. And they take their shahada. Guilt them. So find the problem. Offer a solution. Uh, go for the gold. If they say if they say the shahada, alhamdulillah, you've struck gold. If they don't, find out the other problem. Uh, there's one more issue, and sometimes the simple things. Give them a solution, and move on. That's it. Now, so going for the gold. Any question about this rule? If you want to challenge it, also it's fine. You don't have to agree with me. But if you want to challenge it, you have to give me something. 
One brother said, he kept challenging me one time. This was in Canada. Kept challenging. In the end, I said, what do you have you know, to go against this? He said, um, I just feel. You feel? <laughs> I feel like hitting you right now. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, uh, after trying to find the problem, maybe after, I don't know, 10 or 15, uh -huh. then the person decided, okay, I have to go now. I have no time. What would you do? Like, like time for what? When someone says, I don't have time or... Um, like a lot of times, yeah, um, one time uh, a guy told me I'm going to class. I told him this will take a minute and he took his shahada before he went to class, right? So if someone says I have a meeting in five minutes, it's so simple. By the way, one of, the, one of our young du'at, he was 16, he taught us the technique to walk with the person and buy some time, you know? For someone's carrying groceries, they don't want to stop with heavy bags of potatoes and stuff. So I'll walk with them. On the way, I'm just da -da 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 talking to them. So this guy says, I have a meeting in five minutes. Okay, I'll walk with you. Basically, perhaps you don't know how someone becomes a Muslim. You become a Muslim by saying with your tongue and believing in your heart these concepts that you just agree with, that there is one God only that should be worshipped, and Muhammad Sallallahu is his servant and his messenger. Just say it. We can say it now as we're walking. Look, you don't take no for an answer in a nice way. Yeah? In a Malaysian way. You always remain Malaysian when you're giving Dao, meaning nice, yeah? So never, um, you don't take no for an answer. And we were, we were discussing today, during lunch, we were discussing sales techniques. Um, one of the sales techniques, for example, is for the person to put the item that they're selling in that customer's hands. And then they never take it back again. And psychologically, when I put the, the item in your hand, in your, it's like, what happens to you is you start to take ownership of it. You start to see it as yours. You know, you want to, to buy phones and you hold the phone in your hand and you start to see this as your phone. You've got your games in it, you've got your pictures in it and it's, not, it's yours now. That's why these online auctions, people always overbid because when they win the bid, they start to take ownership of the, they start to see it on the shelf. I'm going to put it here, the clean a place for, huh, this is where I'm going to put it. Then you wake up in the morning, someone outbid you. Ah, he took my thing now. So you outbid him, and sometimes people really go overboard. But go to the market, use the same one, just take it from the shelf for cheaper. This one, it's mine. <laughs> so, so this one salesperson, he used to put something in your hand, and then he, may Allah help you to take it back from him again. You give it back to him. You try to give it back to him, he'll never take it back. What's wrong? You don't like the price? Let me tell you something. Let me give you this with it as well. You don't like the price? He'll never take it back from you. You just have to like drop it on the floor. You know, I don't want it, you know? But he'll never take it back. So a, a good salesman never takes no for an answer. He'll drop the price, he'll add something else to it, you know, just never take no for an answer. Now you don't want to be pushy as du'at, but if someone says no, okay, very politely find out why. I mean, you already, is, well, you already agreed with the concept, so what's stopping you from becoming Muslim? Very simple. In America, we can be a little bit more with people. I can say, look, what's stopping you from doing this right now, just like that? In depending on who you're talking to. You can be very animated, you can speak to them as if you've known them for years. For example, the African American community, they're very relaxed with things like that. So you can, uh, you can just speak to someone like you've known him for years, for the most part. You can't do that with maybe other ethnicities. You, know, you, have, to be, you have to change based on the individual, your, your technique, meaning your style. al muhim so any questions about the golden rule? Yes, sir. Uh. Because uh, I, don't, I don't know about America, but perhaps in America people tend to be more as accepting Good. In, in their commitments. Uh -huh. But in Malaysia, yes. it's not easy to get a shahada because a lot of people will understand that if you become a Muslim, there's no going out. That is the attitude. <laughs> okay. So, because uh, Islam is institutionalized in Malaysia. Very good. Not in America. Excellent. So, that is a big Fantastic, yes. And, and by the way, I'll tell you, uh, thank you very much for, for sharing that. And typically when I teach the, the da'wah course or anything, any da'wah related class around the world, I always tell the audience, the du'at, you, these are some basic guidelines. There's, it's a basic guideline that if you're calling someone to Islam, you ask them to become Muslim, right? Now it's for you to adjust that based on your culture. And so you have to understand that I'm not here on the stage trying to tell you this is what you should do even in Malaysia. I'm standing on the stage telling you basic guidelines and then some of you will say, well, he's just an idiot, he doesn't know Malaysia. And you adjust for Malaysia. 
But because you're Malaysians, you probably won't say he's just an idiot because you guys are so nice. Sorry, sir, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah? So, <laughs> so basically, adjust, adjust for your culture, adjust for your people, adjust for the group, the demographic that you're trying to, uh, to reach, you know, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Feel free to make your adjustment. But what, what I want to get through to you is that there is this idea that if someone's going to become Muslim, you have to ask them. How you do it in a roundabout way, in a direct way, in, in, a, in a letter, you know, put it inside a durian, what, whatever. <laughs> whatever works for you. Wallahi, whatever works. By the way, just for those of you who don't know me, because a lot of people are familiar from the, familiar faces from the camp and everything, I do love durian. I eat it and I don't have a problem with it. I just use it in jokes, but I love durian. It's fantastic for me. Okay? So someone might be offended and he's making fun of durian. No, I love durian. Okay. I just I wish I could take some durian with me to America. So when in customs they're asking me where have you been, I just well I, I, I. <laughs> they'll be the, okay. So you can go. <laughs> Anyways, um, so anything else about the golden rule? Prophet never went to a people to call them to Islam and didn't call them. Yeah. Thumam ibn Uthal was tied to the masjid for three days and every day the Prophet would ask him, how are you, meaning how's your situation, you become Muslim or not? And Muhammad, this brings us to the second golden rule. And that is, create this sense of urgency. There is urgency. The urgency is there, they don't see it. Now, I'm not, did I say the word push? Who said push? Did you hear me say push? Did I utter the word push? Who's saying push? I never said push except in the negative term now no push you're not pressuring people no pressure but you are creating urgency urgency is why now why you need to do this now now you you make you you make this malaysian i'll give you the technique you make it malaysian okay because you're not pushy people so the idea for da'at they don't push but they let the individual know that you don't have forever either you don't have forever and one of the worst things for du'at is when they think the person has forever and one of the worst things for the madru is when they think they have forever. Meaning, I was saying both sides. Um, uh, many times this happens in America. A guy will come into the masjid wanting to take the shahada and the brother will start to give him the shahada and an uncle will come and stop them. Say, no, 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 he's not ready. Let him, let him go and think about it. One time this happened, a friend of mine said, I started giving the guy the shahada and uncle came, stopped. He said, he's not ready. And the guy left the masjid and I never saw him again. Type this uncle, how did he know he's not ready, Akhi? The man came ready. He came to the house of Allah by himself and he said, I want to become Muslim. All you have to do is review. You believe there's one God, Muhammad no. That's it. Give him the shahada. That's it. It's not your job to even delve further. What do you do for a living? You work at a bank or, or no, it's not your business. Yeah? So uh, many times the dua will tell him, think about it, take this, read it. The other day there was a guy who was like, he was very old, old British guy, saw in the masjid in, in, in Sudan. His friend brought him to the masjid. He's been trying to talk to him about Islam for two years. And when his friend was about to take the shahada, <coughs> the guy started, his, I mean, the, the man started to take the shahada. His friend started to hesitate. Uh, maybe, maybe we should let him wait. So, two years he's been waiting. What, what do you want him to wait for? He's ready to do it. He's a grown man. He's ready to do it. No one pushed him. There was no knife to his uh, head or anything. Khalas then. So that's one. Number two, from the side of the person, they think, I can read this later and look into it later. But later what happens? They have exams, papers, they have bills to pay, they have work, and they put it aside. And so many people were this close to becoming Muslim, and these are true stories, and they drop dead. Drop dead. I can tell you a lot of true stories. Where There's one man, never seen a man who loved Islam like that. Loved Islam and Muslim so much. No Muslim ever offered him to become Muslim. So the sister, she said, we were doing the PhD with him. We're all sitting together working as a group. He said, I'm going to go get a drink of water. She said, he went right in front of us like that. Got the water, got a heart attack, and he died right there. This close to becoming Muslim, you could have just invited him. Or let him know that you don't have that much time. How many of these stories? You don't have that much time. But we tell people, no, you just here is the book. Take it, read it slowly over the next 17 years. And then whenever... Do I do things like this? So, urgency is why now? 
And why now? Many times we tell people, look, you have, we're busy in this life. We have bills, exams, papers, we have work. So if you don't do this now while you're convinced, you may never get another chance. And there was a guy in our university, every semester, and I don't know what his name is. I used to call him Al-Hasan because he looks like his name is Al-Hasan. His name wasn't Al-Hasan. Every time he said, Al-Hasan, did you become Muslim yet? And, and then he's even ashamed now. He's like, no, no. Why didn't you? I told you do it last time. I told you you're not gonna, you're not gonna get, come back to it. You're gonna be too busy. Shaitan, that's his job. Yeah. Ex see him next. Hassan, did you become Muslim? Mm, no. Mm -hmm. Didn't I tell you to do it last time? You still didn't listen to me. Do it now, man. No, I need time. You don't have time. You, they don't have time. How do you know you have time? This is a true story. There was a dinner for non-Muslims. And then at the end of the, the, there was a lecture for them, yani, a dinner and a lecture. At the end of the lecture, they brought this <coughs> lady and she wanted to become Muslim. So I did a quick check with her. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, yes. Five pillars, yes. Everything's good, yes. I told her, okay, you now, same stuff I repeat to everybody. It's the same speech. It's just new to them. You now have the ingredients of being a Muslim. You agree with it and that's how you become Muslim. You just say what you agreed with a few seconds ago. So become a Muslim right now. Mm, no. I said, okay, why not? She said, I need more time. So the next question is, how much time do you need? She said, two months. Now, I'm telling you exactly what I said. I'm not changing the story. She said, I need two months. I said, exactly. Two months is too long. She said, okay, Friday. Like that, this quickly. It was Wednesday night. She said, Friday. She went from two months to two days. You see why? Yani, she went from two months to two. Did I push her? I just said, two months is too long. It's too much. So she said, okay, Friday, I'll do it. I said, now I'm going to try one more time. So, What's going to happen from now till Friday? You're just going to be busy tomorrow, we'll work, and then we'll wake up Friday. Just do it right now. What will happen on Friday? So do it right now. She said, no, I'll come to your center on Friday after the class. I'll take the shahad. I said, okay. If there's nothing else I can do to convince you, just do me this favor. From now until Friday, please wear your seatbelt and drive very carefully and don't die. <laughs> she said, oh, you're scaring me. I said, well, I'm sorry, but that's how it works. So many people died and they were interested in Islam. The angel of death doesn't say, well, she has a Friday appointment. Saturday morning will come knock on her door. <laughs> so just drive carefully and try not to die until Friday. That's all. Yeah? Any pressure here? No. Yes. No pressure. Right? So uh, that's it. I got in my car. I drove home. And then the sisters called my cell phone. They said, uh, Alhamdulillah, she took her shahad. So creating the urgency. You don't have forever. Death can come at any minute. And if you don't do it now, maybe you'll never get a chance to look at this again. And we give them stories of people who never got a chance to read again or never got a chance to speak to a Muslim again. And they died before that happened. So creating the urgency. Did the Prophet do this? Oh, how many times and how many places did the Prophet do this? How many times in the seerah, Ya Fulan, Qul la ilaha illallah, Thumam ibn Uthal, like we mentioned, the Prophet tied him up to the masjid for three days and every day he would come and ask him how he is, meaning a change of heart, checking on him like that. And then um, with Umar ibn Khattab, but of course the, the background of the story is that they thought Umar radiallahu anhu was trying to come to kill the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ grabbed him and shook him. Don't use this technique here. I don't think it will work. Yeah? Isn't it time for you, O son of Al-Khattab? Uh, Ikram ibn Abi Jahl, in one narration where... No, not Ikram ibn Abi Jahl. Um, in one narration, in Walid ibn Mughira, and uh, when the Prophet ﷺ... No, um, Walid ibn Mughira, his best friend since childhood. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'eet. Yeah? And the Prophet was in his home and he, he, he invited the Prophet he said he's going to fix relations between the Prophet and the Quraysh. So he invites him to his home and he brings food. And it was for the Arabs, it's very bad if a guest comes to your home and he doesn't eat. So he tells the Prophet eat. The Prophet said, I'm not going to eat. He said, eat. He said, I won't eat until you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha and Muhammad Rasulullah. So the man said the Shahada, so the Prophet ate in his home, just so the Prophet would eat. Now the Prophet was trying to get him to, he was hoping that the Shahada will pull him into Islam. Because where did this happen before? His uncle Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. He publicly said he was Muslim, but he wasn't. He only said it to justify hitting, I'm, I mean I'm shortening the story, to justify hitting Abu Jahl. Jahl. 
So to justify that, he said, "Atusubu Muhammad, wa ana ala dini." You curse Muhammad. Well, I'm upon his religion. Aqulu ma yaqul, and he hit him. So now he publicly said he's Muslim, but he just used it as an excuse. And now he can't go back on his word. So he says he goes to the Kaaba. He makes du'a to Allah. He said, "No sooner had I finished the du'a, Islam entered my heart." So the Prophet was hoping that when Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt will say the shahada, it will pull him into Islam. Let's see if the technique worked. Taban, the story here is to say urgency. The story isn't to say use this technique. You understand? Take take a guy for nasila mak is like, you know, <laughs> I won't eat until whatever. And the point the point is the urgency. I just want you to see. So then he actually Uqba then goes back and he was Muslim. But what happened? His best friend from, from since childhood, Abu Ibn Mughira, said, "No way! You either me or Muhammad, sallam." And the man makes a huge mistake, and he goes back and he spits on the blessed face of the Prophet sallam. And Allah, this also uh, the ayah, "You may adul zalimu ala yadi," you know. And, and anyways, it's really it's linked to that. So, but the point is, many times also on the, the eve of the conquering of Mecca, Abu Sufyan. Is in the tent of the Prophet sallam. He's not a Muslim. The Prophet tells him, "Isn't it time for you to believe that La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah?" He said, "As for La ilaha illa Allah, I don't have a problem with that. Muhammad Rasulullah, I still have issues with this." So Al Abbas tells him, "Do it." They're encouraging him now, and he says the shahada. Now, is it quality shahada? Not necessarily, but it doesn't matter. The point is, now I'm not saying get bad quality shahadas. The point is here is that the shahada is step one that you're saying I'm willing to submit. And then he narrates himself that Iman only entered his heart the second day, the second day, yeah. So the point is create the urgency. You don't have forever. You don't have the rest of your life. You don't know how long the rest of your life is. If you're convinced, do this now and in a very kind, gentle way. Try to convince someone to become Muslim. And again, if you're finding any of this stuff from experience, and I know, sir, that you are experienced. Yani, we don't want to praise you, but you are an experienced da'iya, correct? And without overpraise, you've spoken to people, yeah. So, based on his on experience, he's and he has come up with how to work around certain issues. And I'm pointing to him because he has experience to say this. We don't want you just sitting here, and if you've never experienced this, just to say no, this won't work. Try something. And there is, and in the end, the human beings around you in this world find a way that will work around them. And it, it can't be that you're surrounded by people that there's no technique that will work on them. Even roundabout ways, indirect ways, slow, very subtle, over months, fine. Maybe there's no shahadas in 10 minutes, maybe 10 months. Okay, that's your technique, Ten, whatever. I mean, figure it out, but don't stop yourself and say, it's not going to work, and they'll be offended. Just try something. We've got to do something for this deen. Yeah? And this same guy who's a da'ya, oh, people will be offended if I'm in their face. But if he's hired at a clothing store, he'll come in their face. But why is it for clothing, for jeans, you're like in people's, people's face? For the religion, huh? try something nice, you know? Anyways, that's the second golden rule. Create the urgency, and meaning now. Why not now? And if it's not now, it may be never. You may never get another chance. You may never get another reminder. You might die before you get a chance. You might become busy with life. So, that was the second golden rule. Okay. Um, hmm, so should, we, should we do questions? Let's do questions. We have got 30 minutes. Let's do some questions. Because uh, even though the questions have all been... Oh, okay. There was one I was asked earlier. Let's do that one. Is about the age of Aisha. I'm going to do, start with this as the first question, and then you can ask whatever ones, you know. So the age of Aisha, there are many ways to do this. And that's why many times, there are multiple ways to answer a question. And, and you can choose the one that you like the most, the one that works for you the best, or you can choose it based on the indiv in individual in front of you. So now, if in America now, you know, the, okay, the age of Aisha, so many arguments. One of them, Aisha radiallahu was actually larger for her age. Uh, in hot climates, women uh, mature, uh, the rich menses before women in cold climates. And when a woman reaches menses, it's, it's sent, the, her, the body is saying, I'm able to give birth, right? So if she's able to give birth, what will stop her from marriage? The other issue becomes then the mental maturity. So we're going to talk about that. Um, one of the ways now in the West, when someone, 
if, if in America someone comes to me and says, why did your prophet marry a young girl? This, I don't explain, well, uh, this is my question to her. How old would you have liked her to be? How old would you have liked her to be? And then he says, what? Whatever number he gives me, I question that number. 18. Why 18? Is there any study that says 18 is the best age for marriage? No. Biology that says 18 is... No. Psychology, anything, any research that says 18 is the best number? No. Uh, okay, then 17. I ask the same questions about 17. If he says 16, same questions. 15, same questions. What? Who determines the age? Now, today, none of us, even the last all the men in the room, none of us here would like to marry a 12-year-old. True or false? Because today they're children. They're, they're children, you know, and they're still in school and there's a, there's a system now. They have to go through a, a schooling system for many years just so they can learn the world that they're living in. But let's say right now, there's, let's say, a Bedouin group or, or let's say a tribe that's very primitive that lives in the deep, deep forests. And all the skills you need, let's say, as a male, is how to hunt and clean that animal and bring it home and build a house. There are no other skills in that society. Maybe build some weapons. So if a boy by the age of 15 learned all these skills, all right? And let's say the skills for the woman in that tribe are to know how to clean the hut, clean the food and cook it, all right? And that's it. These are all the skills in that society. So now they've reached, and she is now as knowledgeable at age 13 as any old woman that's who's 80 in the tribe. They, know, they have the same skills. They don't have credit cards and these complex systems that they need to learn for years. So now if this 15-year-old boy who's now reached the, the epitome of knowledge and maturity in his village, yeah, and this girl is 13, want to get married, what's the problem? What's the problem? He, he's able to have a home within the simple... Today, if a 15 and 13 year old want to get married today, he's still going through school, she's going, how is he going to work, and he's still immature. But in that society, what's wrong with it? So now this 15 year old is going to marry a 13 year old. Imagine the day of the wedding, a white guy comes up, and he interrupts the wedding. No, 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 we're not going to have any of this, okay? He's 15 and she's 13. This is not acceptable in America. <laughs> you know what they're going to say? Let's eat him. <laughs> who, who, who are you? Who are you? So basically, the whole thing of why did your prophet marry a young woman? So okay. Realistically, it's like saying, what do you care? This was 1,400 plus years ago in a society where it was acceptable because they didn't have what we have today where the school system, where this person's a child. You know, a 12-year-old now is a baby. She's still playing with dolls. You marry a 12-year-old and she wants toys and she wants gum and candy and she's crying in the market like, we're buying potatoes. No, I want candy. You don't want to marry it because we have a system that's different. The world's different. But back then it was acceptable. Even Aisha radiallahu anha was spoken for before the Prophet Yeah? So that means then all that is, is happening is that the person is being ethnocentric. Ethnocentrism is when we think our, our culture is the best and it's superior. It's inherently superior to every other culture. And this happens all, all the time. Yeah? If you're sitting in here right now and you have an Indian background, you know Indian culture is the best. Yeah? And if you're Malay, you know Malays are the best, right? Malays are the best, right? Better. And if you're Chinese, you're like, no, Chinese culture is the best. And if you're Arab, you're sitting here like all these brothers and sisters are foolish. We are the best. <laughs> Everybody thinks their way, their culture is the best. So what happens is, nations, every nation typically does that. It's called ethnocentrism. Yeah? Which is the right way to drive the car? Which is, which is to drive on the road? The left side or the right side of the road? What do you think? The right side of the road? The, so, okay, to so have the steering wheel on the right, let's make the car. The steering wheel should be on the right side of the car or the left side of the car? What do you think? The right side? What, why? Why is the right side better than the left? Because it's right? Yeah? So it should be on the right side because that's right. Yeah? Why should it be on the right side? Give me a good argument. Yes, sir. The ideal place is in the middle. It's the safest place for the driver. That's why I always tell people, you know, the, there's a car called the McLaren F1. 
It costs like $1.4 million dollars, and it's like in the, the seat is in the middle. That's the best car. If you can't afford a McLaren, pff, what kind of loser are you, all right? <laughs> right? So which is better, the right side or the left side to put the steering wheel? Yeah? Sunnah is right, yeah? So that's why all these countries, they chose it based on the Sunnah, right? <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Then what happens, people in America argue it's the left side, yeah? And if you guys, when you guys go to countries where it's on the left, when you probably get in the car, it looks ugly to you, true? And I'll be honest with you, when I get into cars on the right side, I look at it and look, it's weird, it's like, like this, is staring with her. This guy is with his left hand moving. We're the right hand, yeah, yeah. yeah. Realistically, I'm not right and you're not right. There is no right and wrong. The brothers in the UK tried to argue with me and then they said more countries drive with, on the right side and the steering wheel on the right. And then they went to Wikipedia and they found just a few. <laughs> just a few. But then they tried to add more, well, there's one billion people in India. Mm -hmm. That's your argument? There's a very nice photograph I just found two weeks ago. Very nice photograph. The first day Sweden switched from right, left hand to right hand. Uh, yeah? Right hand to left hand. Yeah, I need the steering wheel. The first day they switched, the first morning when they made the switch, and someone took a, a picture of the road, this fantastic black and white photo, and cars were just everywhere on the road. Pe people didn't know how to do it. Yeah? But it's wrong to say there are more countries that drive on the left, therefore driving on the left, meaning steering wheel on the left, is more correct. All it is is cultures think their way is the best way. That's all it is. That's all it is. That's why Europe is a continent. I don't know, do they teach you that Europe is a continent here? Or are there, are there six or seven continents in Malaysian schools? Seven, yeah? And not all the world teaches that there are seven continents. You know, some countries teach that there are six continents. And I personally am one of those people who don't believe Europe is a continent whatsoever. Europe is just part of Asia. What's Europe? I mean, I can call the region Europe, but I don't believe Europe is a continent. It's just a part of Asia. You tell me, oh, you know, Russia is part in Europe and part in Asia. Why? What makes Europe Europe? I can see South Africa and South America. That's a continent, clear. North America, Africa, I see it. Australia, I see. Europe, it's just part of Asia. But you know, it, the modern historians who have written about this, they said all it is is Eurocentrism. The Europeans thought they were so important that they made this little extension they're on, an, a, a continent. Uh, geographically, it's not a continent because it, Europe is on the same tectonic plate as Asia. India is on its separate tectonic plate. India has more of a right to become a continent. Yeah, not a subcontinent, a continent. Arabia is also on its own tectonic plate. So we can even argue that they could be... But Europe is on the same plate as Asia. So what's Europe? Europeans thought they were so important that they made this little area, which you can take it like this and fit it in just a small part of the you know, United States. They made it a continent. And that's why Columbus discovered America. Yeah, America wasn't there until Columbus discovered it. It didn't exist until he discovered it. You, you understand? That's what it means when Columbus discovered it. It didn't exist, even though there were people there who were getting married and divorced and having children and having a life. But it didn't exist until we knew it was there. Until we knew it was there. So that's Eurocentrism. So when someone tells me, why did your prophet marry a young woman? He's saying, my culture is so right that I have the right to go back 1,400 years in time and question an entirely different culture by what my current culture said is a standard. Not long ago, yeah, like, uh, yeah, like not, well now it's getting longer, yeah, like 90 years ago, 100 years ago, there were statesmen who would marry 9-year-olds, nine 11-year-olds. Nine year in Virginia there was uh, an official who married an 11-year-old, a 10-year-old. It was acceptable. So only recent history said, uh, actually by the way, you, you, most states in America, the age to get married is not 18. 18 is when a woman can marry herself off. But most states in America, a 15-year-old can get married as long as the parents sign. 14-year-old, many states in America, 16, 17. So they never said a woman should get married at 18. They said a woman can marry herself off at age 18. But 16-year-olds can get married in America. So there's no sciences, nothing. You just think your culture is so superior that you can qu question every other culture in the world based on that. You know? 
And Sheikh Walid can tell you so much about different cultures and how everyone thinks their way is the best. One of the best things he, and he examples he mentioned in Japan. In Japan, uh, he's saying that uh, at work, you know, if you people work at an office, the women make the tea for everyone in the office, not the men. And so a lady, was she Canadian? Well, American, who was critiquing that. A Canadian woman was saying that's so sexist and why the women make the tea. And it's not sexist. Yeah? You think that because you're thinking in terms of your culture and you think your culture is always right. He said, it's courtesy. Like now, if a man and a woman are getting into a car, who will open the door for the other? The man will open, right? And that's courtesy. That's a nice thing to do. And in Japan, the nice thing to do, women make the tea. It's not degrading. But because people make these connections, so it's degrading and it's sexist, of men, why the women are slaves, why they make the tea. I opened the door for you. I didn't feel anything wrong with that. You make the tea, and we're just co-workers. What's the issue? Yeah, do you understand? But people just think their, their way is the best. And Muhim, so, so that's our new answer to this whole issue with Aisha. What age would you like her to be? And whatever age you say, there's no science behind it. This was something that was acceptable in that culture. And then you can cite many marriages of you know, older men to women. Uh, you know, Umar ibn Khattab married Umm Kulthum. This when he was older and she was a young daughter of Ali radiallahu anh, and so many many other men what was the issue and the Quraysh never once said look Muhammad sallallahu alayhi marries young women because they didn't see anything wrong with it so if there's nothing wrong with it in that culture what business is it of yours a thousand four hundred years later today no one would do it because today they're children but back then the woman has reached psychosocial maturity and physical maturity what's the problem why would Allah create a woman able to have to children at age 13? She's actually, uh, it, you know, as you know, pregnancy is easier for younger women than older women. The older you get, the more problems. So what's the issue then? Yeah? Anyways, and so on and so forth. So I know that was long-winded, but it's a very important question. And, and the problem with when nations are ethnocentric, if that nation is a powerful nation, the weaker nations start to see their cultural way as a superior way as well. And that's why, and the minority as well will start to see that. That's why in America you always hear this question. Why can't we eat pork in Islam? Why are you asking me just about pork? Here's another good question. Put your hand up and say, why can't we eat dogs in Islam? But no one ever asks you that question in America. You know why? Because Americans don't eat dogs. That's why. If Americans ate dogs, he'd be looking at a dog burger and he would say, why can't we eat dog? But because Americans don't eat dog, he didn't ask that question. So uh, now, if someone says, why can't we eat pork? Say, well, how come you don't ask me, why don't we eat pork? Uh, dog. And why aren't you asking that question? We don't eat dog. There are many things we don't eat. Why are you only asking about pork? Because you live around people who eat pork. So then, why don't I do that? Their way, is something, and it seems okay to you now. Anyways, so... That is ethnocentrism, and it's the core issue behind the age of Aisha radiallahu anha. And Allah ibarak fiqh. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, you, you call them back to Allah Azza You find out, it, like, the scenario is, someone left Islam, became atheist, became Christian, whatever it is. Find out, first of all, what caused that. What doubt, what issues did they miss? There's for sure there's something they had, some kind of doubt, shubaha, they, they misunderstood about Islam. You, you sit down with this individual, find out what the problem is, fix it, call them back to Allah Azza That's in a nutshell. And there's no other choice. What other choice do you have? That's it. So... Uh, there's a true story. A woman used to wear hijab, pray in the masjid, and be active in the community, became Christian in America. What was her issue? Very simple. Jesus came to her in a dream. He told her to become a Christian. That's it? How do you fix that one? What's, the, what's your focus on when you talk to her? Naam? Say it, say it, say it. It's okay, say it. What are you going to tell her? Congratulations. So you have something in your mind, say it, naam. Uh -huh. It 
could be change your sentence. It could be shaitan. It could be shaitan or it could be Jesus himself. It's for sure shaitan, isn't it? For sure. Yeah, I know it's not Jesus or Nuh. Hey, I'm Jesus. We know it's shaitan. So yes, go, keep going. So you know, that you're done, right? It could be shaitan. Yeah? So, Tiller, look, if in the end people become Muslim based on dreams, what's the value of Allah sending prophets? What's the value of Allah sending books if people just have dreams? And like one time, this guy was telling me, I feel it in here, Jesus is God. That's how I know I'm on the truth. I said, so you're telling me what you feel here tells you if you're on the truth or not? He said, yes. I said, okay, I will take you now, put you in a room with a Buddhist who felt it in here, and a Hindu next to him who felt it in here, and a Jew who felt it in here, and a Muslim who felt it in here. So when I get all you feelers in the room together, now I'm going to say, okay, you felt it, you felt it, you felt it, and all of you, you felt something that took you in a different direction. So wouldn't you now all agree that feeling it in here has to be, look, we all have to in this room now dis discover which is the truth. We're going to have a discussion to find out who has the truth. Since we all felt something, would you all agree that we have to, I mean, what's the word, lama? Disqualify. Don't we have to disqualify feeling it in here as a judgment, to, as a measurement for, of truth? Yes, okay, now everyone get that thing out of there. Now what's our next measurement? Let's look at scripture, for example. And you know you're going to win that one. Yeah? I have the only one that's reliable, never been changed, and so on and so forth. So you can change the, the playing field, as they say. So, her pro so find out what their problem is. Oh, atheist. You know, I was uh, in Calgary. I dealt with a number of, uh, of Muslims who left Islam, and they became atheists. A number of them. And each one of the cases, one, they, were, they had uh, it was a case of uh, very poor logical thinking. And one of them, just not understanding what he's reading. One of them read a hadith that was translated poorly by some publishing company. He said this hadith is scientifically wrong. If he is a genuine prophet, وسلم, it shouldn't be wrong. He left Islam. Type, Sweetheart, did you even check any other book? Read another translation of this hadith? Or read the original? Or ask a scholar? You just left based on this? So, many th so find out what their problem is. Fix it. Work with them. Call them back to Allah Azza Allahu Allah. Okay? Yes, next question. Yes, sir. Two techniques of doing the indirect da'wah uh -huh. methods for people who are purely resistant to the yes. religion. Yes. Which is the phone system and the body system. And yes. That. From your own experience, is there any other techniques? Yeah. yeah. So are there any other indirect da'wah techniques? Um, T-shirts, indirect da'wah, a message that's like you're wearing like that. Um, leaving pamphlets in places, indirect da'wah, doctor's office, trains, buses, that's indirect da'wah. Making billboards and signs, you know, what is the purpose of life, all, all kinds of creative things that, uh, that people have. Sometimes these buses, uh, they're buses, they'll pay a lot of money, they put a da'wah sign on the bus and they'll drive around town like this or a billboard in a very good place or like a masjid will have a place across, uh, right near the highway, many cars pass, they put a big sign that has some message in it, you know. Um, what else is indirect da'wah? You have the notes. <laughs> Naam? Sending emails, sending texts, it could be indirect. I've got one of the nicest brothers I know. I asked him how he started to practice. He said one day I got a text from a brother that said, and he's a Muslim, man, but it said, contemplate, read Surah Al-Zumar and contemplate it. He said I actually took it seriously and it was just sent to him. It wasn't a mass uh, email. It was just text that was sent to him on his phone, he said, read Surah Al-Zumar and think about it, contemplate it. He said, I, I freed myself between Maghrib and Isha, I went to the masjid, took the Quran, I read Surah Al-Zumar and I kept thinking about it. He said, I changed and this, sent, this text was sent to me two years ago and the guy who sent it to me, I've never met him since I knew him, but he doesn't even know that I've changed. And for two years I've been praying and all these things. So that's indirect, yani it's not someone coming to your face and saying, but it's more, yani it's borderline, it's like between direct and indirect. Yani. But anyways, different techniques like that. Yeah, you had your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, Sheikh, so I want to share with you. Um, a very, I mean, listening to your lecture, it just makes sense that when you're going for a dawah, it requires some uh, fundamental understanding and a lot of confidence when you when you go and speak because you're you're doing sales. But uh, but I also feel that the current situation that we're living in, unfortunately, Islam has been politicized and. 
uh, there's been a lot of oppression and wrong which has been done by our own Muslim. Are you talking about Malaysia or the world? I'm talking in general. I mean, okay. the, the common sentiments about how the Muslim image has come about in yes. the current time. Now, that becomes a, a huge value for ourselves because yes. when you look at CNN, you look at BBC, you, need, you know that there's a wrong message being going out. Correct. You're trying to defend that and then you're trying to give the Islamic message. How do you think you really come, you, you fight, fight that back? And you come out, feel confident, and then go about uh, giving the dawah? Okay. Um, I think everyone heard the question, yeah, so uh, basically, and, and the truth is, you're correct, instead of now me walking down the road to give dawah, I'm going uphill to give dawah, it's just more work for me now, more burden now, um, and, and that's, it's more of a reason for us to work harder than to sit back, yeah, so now I have to make twice, and work twice as hard to get the message across, and I have to make sure that it's, a, like I said, a pleasant experience, you know, his big smile, and he, you already look like the guy they're afraid of, yeah? Starts with a T. So, uh, what's your name? My name is Al. Last name Kaida. Al Kaida. You know? so, so, so basically, uh, the point is, so now you've got more work to do, and you have to work against all this, so you have to represent your religion that says, well, you know what, these guys can't be the ones we heard about. He's coming to me and smiling and he cares. Um, so the confidence, f it comes from you knowing the truth. Knowing the truth and knowing the, the excellence of da'wah, you knowing your, your, your place as someone who's calling people to Allah Azza wa Jal, someone who's clearing away the, the fog or the misconceptions. And you know what the truth is, so you're confident in, per in conveying that to people. Walk up to people and, and people might even bring that up bring up you know killing and terror and we used to even joke about that with people people would say um, yeah you know but the only thing about your someone actually said this in washington to us uh, to me straight yeah, and he, not telling you a third story he said the only thing wrong with islam is it that it commands you to kill the non-muslims and i said to him you know if if islam commanded us to kill non-muslims we wouldn't be talking right now he looked at me and he started laughing if Islam says kill non-Muslims, why am I talking to you nicely? You know, like, I'm like, yeah, come, I want to invite you for lunch. <laughs> yeah? Um, also, like, you, just facts. You get people to wake up. You're confident because you're awake and people are asleep. So you're waking people up. One guy says, yeah, but the violence, you know, Islam is a violent religion. It commands violence. I said, listen, there are estimated 7 to 10 million Muslims in America. If their religion was to be violent and injure other people, don't you think we'd always hear about more murders in the news? There'd be violence all over the newspapers. All the time, all we hear is violence. 10 million people and their religion is to hurt their neighbors. But yet, you don't hear anything. So then just facts like that. So that brings, that's where your confidence comes from. That people are asleep and Allah made me from those who are awake and I'm doing the work of the prophets. Yeah, work of the prophets to guide people to the truth. I don't know if that's exactly what you were looking for, but that's what I could come up with. Wallahu alam. Um, yes, sister, I'll get to you, inshallah. Naam. Um, this is basically a frequently asked question by my non Muslim colleagues. Your colleagues you said? Yeah, my non Muslim colleagues. Why do they think that we should be doing dawah and we should not be doing dawah? Why do they think that? And not the women, or just that's your question? Why are Muslim men allowed to marry for? Yeah, marry for. And then you say, <laughs> uh huh. You don't have to say yes. It doesn't mean you're a good guy. If you can say, oh no, I he better not think about it. I'll kill him. You can say whatever you want to say. Okay. Very good. I have two tips. If someone says, why are men allowed to marry four? I ask, why not? Yani, what? Yeah. What's, what's the issue? Like, it's not like Islam said men are allowed to like, murder babies. So that's a good question if you come and say, why are men allowed to murder babies in Islam? Because that's a bad thing. So when you come and tell me, why are men allowed to marry four in Islam? My first question is, wh why not? I mean, what is the issue? If, if then you get into romance, oh, well, it will break her heart. <laughs> okay, look. 
So one woman came in Canada, she said, I am ready to become Muslim. And there's only one issue in Islam. Before she said anything, I said, polygamy? She said, yes. <laughs> I told her, listen, it's just like, I just said a few sentences, that was the end of the issue. I said, listen to me. <laughs> like that, I said, listen. Polygamy is not obligatory in Islam. It's something that's there and it's permissible. There are billions of Muslims on earth. Some people chose to deal with it. Some people don't want to deal with it in their life. It's a choice. Be you don't stop becoming Muslim because there's an option that some people can do if they want to. This is a relationship between you and Allah. Become a Muslim and don't get in a into a polygamous relationship. That's it. I told her it's, in, it's just something that's allowed. Some people do it, some people don't do it. I know, I know in Malaysia a lot of people are doing the, you know, behind backs. That's not what Islam designed. That's, forget that. Okay? So, it, and it's nobody's job to come and say, why do you have two wives, huh? Yeah, be loyal, man. Have, be loyal to one. What's wrong with you, you disloyal? Uh, that's not his job. If pe two people next to each other, this guy has one wife, this guy has two wives. It's not this guy's job, the guy with one wife, to come knock on his door. Why did you do this, huh? Was there anything wrong with your first wife? No, she's a good woman. It's not his business. And it's not the guy who has two wives. It's not his business to go knock on this guy's door. Yeah, be a man. Go out, get another woman. <laughs> it's just something that's allowed. It's, that's, wallahi, that's all it is. It's just something that's allowed in the deen. You don't have to deal with it if you don't want to. You know, and that's even a woman can get a divorce if her husband gets it. It's better to be patient, but she can, and she can get out of that relationship. So what's the issue? So when someone asks me, why is it allowed? You're, what, they're ask, what they're saying in the question is that they're insinuating it's a bad thing. Okay, it's a bad thing for you. Some guy likes it. Uh, you know, you guys are, you know, let's use durian. I love to use durian in examples. Okay, imagine someone, okay, I love this example. This is a great example. Look, imagine someone comes to you and says, why do you eat durian? Huh? Why do you eat du Why? You're like, as a Malay, you're like, what's the problem? Why not? It's just, it's good, huh? I like it. Yeah, you, do I have to explain why I eat durian? You never have to explain, right? If someone says, comes to you and says, why do you eat durian? Won't you say, oh, let's leave durian. We can understand his objection. Let's say, brother comes, why do you eat rice? You, you, what will you say? Why not? What, is there something wrong with rice that I don't know? The guy's like, mm -mm, I don't like rice. So because you don't like rice, I should not eat rice? So you don't like polygamy? Become Muslim and don't deal with it. Or don't deal with it. But it's just something that's out there that's allowed. Just like there's rice and there's bread. You don't have to eat rice, you can eat bread. So it's exactly like that. So don't accept the question, that, why does, is it allowed? It's just something that's allowed. Some people want to do it. What's your problem? It's something that's there. But if it's like, you have to marry for, then you can come and say, why do you have to marry for? Fine. Yeah? I thought your question was going to be, why can't the woman marry for? No, but I think anyone who uses his brain for two minutes will understand why. Yeah. Right? Okay. Allahu ta'ala alam. Yes, sir. Uh, yesterday you mentioned, uh, I don't know to be the best friend. Yes, right? if you truly don't know. Okay, uh, let's say you're in a situation, you're just alone with a non-Muslim, you're giving da'wah to him, and it just so happens that uh, maybe you don't have all the answers to his question. Mm -hmm. So you keep saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But in the end, you're asking for shahada from him. Um, so how, how, I mean, what is your advice? Or yeah. Okay. <laughs> But in that scenario, we, I, I remember we recommended that you ask for the shahada when the person, there's nothing between him and saying it, right? So maybe, let's say in this scenario, he asked you a bunch of questions, let's say they were complex and you didn't have the answers, but these questions were not obstacles for him, he was just curious, right? If he's just curious and they're not obstacles, you can still ask for the shahada. But let's say these were big issues for him, like I can't become Muslim until you explain all this. So now you're, you still keep saying I don't know, but then you say, look, the fact that I don't know doesn't mean these questions have not been answered. I'm going to go and get you the answer and next time, I'll get, and, you know, next time we sit, I'll have them for you, inshallah. So that's all it is. Yeah? But if these questions are just curiosity-based and they uh, they're not obstacles to him saying the shahada, you still get him to say the shahada. 
So okay, so you said the Shahada, congratulations, becoming Muslim, and don't worry, I'll get you the, the answer to that question you asked me about. Okay, it's not a very important issue, I was just curious, fine, I'll get you the answer. You see the difference? Yeah. Wallahu alam. I hope, I hope that was what you were looking for. Okay, something else? Yes, sir. Work, how do you, when you get from, how do you have that conversation forward? Because that's an interesting thing you said earlier, but not setting fast. We want to set the fire. At the same time, how do you, you know, break the ice and then tell me that? Okay, um, how much time do we have? Huh? Last question, huh? No more time? I forgot about the, the, the ticket to Islamic exercise. Look, it's like this. When you want to bring up a topic, and you, you really care to bring it up, you find a way to do it. And that's why the exercise I was supposed to do with, with you is that, how can I take any topic and go from that topic to Islam? And that's like when, I mean, brothers know this, when a brother wants to propose, right? He'll, he'll, from any topic, he'll bring it back to marriage. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anything, he'll just bring it back to marriage. And when you want something, you find a way. Someone give me a very random topic and we'll see if we can tie it to Islam. Something very random, anything. Pick a topic. Durian. durian. <laughs> Very good. <clears throat> Someone tells me about durian. I I'm sitting next to a non-Muslim. We're talking about durian and I want to be talking about Islam. Yeah, durian, it leaves quite a smell in, in the mouth. But, you know, in Islam, if you have a bad odor in your mouth, you're not allowed to go to the mosque. So I was having this discussion with some Malays. If I eat durian, should I go to pray in the mosque or not? And we concluded that because they don't think the smell is bad, I would go to the mosque if I ate durian in Malaysia, but in America I wouldn't go near the mosque and, and that's because Islam cares so much about, you know, individual. Boom! I'm talking about Islam already. You see? Something else. Random. Huh? Rat teeth? Oh, Brad Pitt. <laughs> I don't know how I heard rat teeth. I was like... Brad Pitt is very easy. Come on, people. Brad Pitt is too easy. Come on. Yes. Chuck Board. No, no. Finish Brad Pitt first. <laughs> Nam. <Naam. laughs> you know how, like, okay, you have to make it a little subtle. She said, Who created Brad Pitt? <laughs> Imagine someone said, Did you see the new movie by Brad Pitt? Who created Brad Pitt? <laughs> More subtle, Helwa, okay? So, Ish, it's really easy. Brad Pitt. He is married to Angelica Jumbuli, <laughs> right? And she made a documentary about Serbia and Serbian Muslims and she was you know, wearing a hijab in one of the interviews. But actually she didn't become Muslim. You know about Islam? Bam! I'm talking about Islam. <laughs> what else? Blackboard? Chalkboard? How do you go from chalkboard to Islam? Someone give me steps. Come on, volunteer. Stand up. Give me steps from a chalkboard to Islam. Let's do this. Huh? Yes. When you, when, you, when you use the talk board for writing stuff, you can explain yourself better. Uh -huh. And then you can document stuff. Uh -huh. When the stamp came, the first person goes to write it down. Woo! Yes. Mm, mm, mm. You hear what he said? He said, say it again. So when you use it. When you use a chalkboard, you can uh, express yourself better and you also document things and write it down. And when Islam was revealed, the first verses was to write it down. Yes. Allahu Akbar. Yeah. It's easy. Prophet even once, he didn't have a chalkboard, but he used the visual aid and he drew a long, side in the sand, long line in the sand and he said, Hada suratullah al-mustaqeem. Then he drew other lines from it. Khalas, there we go. Prophet used something like a chalk. So easy. Something else? Football? Football. Huh? Come on, people, it's so easy. Yes. There are 50 Muslim players in English Premier 50 Muslim players. Do you like Zaydan? Ah, he's Muslim. Ibra <laughs> who's, I, I don't even know a lot of football, but I do know two. I know Zidane, I know this other guy, something Ibra Ibrahimovic or something. Yeah? Well, I, he left Islam. <laughs> Use it, yeah. Well, whatever. Yeah, and it, so easy. Come on, something harder. Actually, there is no hard. Naam. Purple? Purple. Huh, purple. It's easy, purple. I already have it. Come on. Huh? It's time to stop, yeah? Oh, you're just standing up? Okay. Uh, uh. Now I'm purple. Yes. Allah created purple. <laughs> yes? 
You can, you can see purple, na, because of Allah. Okay. Do you have anything more subtle, sister? <laughs> huh? Naam, purple. Who's who's talking? Who's talking? Yes, ma'am. Purple free fruits and purple flowers. Okay, that's good. That's a step, and then you can move from there to another step, and you can go from colors to whatever, to, and from colors to colors of red jenna, or from colors to like purple, and you know, and then diversity, variety. Diversity, variety. That's all part of Allah's creation. That Allah could have made this world black and white, but He made colors in it, and but just go from there. It's so easy. Purple. I, from purple, I go from purple to mangosteen, mangosteen to a, 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 a component in them called uh, xanthones that are in very in linked, linked to uh, cancer cures. And the mangosteen shell has 40 types or only 200 types of xanthones in nature. Mangosteen shell has only has 40 in itself. So a lot of people, they, they make it into a pulp and they drink it like with a smoothie or something like that. There's a this doctor on YouTube, he's surprised when he found out what xanthones do to cancerous cells. He said, I don't understand why we're not stu studying this for, for a cancer cure. Then Allah said he never revealed uh, an illness, put down an illness, except that he put the solution. And that's only fair. It's not fair to Allah, for Allah to bring down an illness on earth and not give him any way to fix it. That wouldn't be fair. Boom, I'm talking about Islam already and Allah. Yeah? Can we do two more and then stop, uh, Sheikh Shazali? Can we do two, three more and then stop? Yeah, yeah, Oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay, let's go. Yes, sir. Phone. What? Phone. Cell phone? Yeah. Cell phone? Cell phone. How do you go from <laughs> cell phone to Allah? <laughs> How do you go from cell phone to Allah? Allama al insana ma alame. Yes. The, the cre oh, mm, mm. <laughs> uh, you, okay. And so the sister basically, she, she's gonna take it, and yani slowly, she's gonna take it to how the creator of the cell phone can't be just like the cell phone. Therefore, the creator of humans can't be a human and can't be like humans, meaning have a beginning and an end also, and things like that. And you can just expound from there. So that's a good link. Any other link for cell phones? Yes. Huh. Huh? You cannot see it, but it's there. Ooh. Mm, mm, mm. The, the, the waves, the radio waves the cell phone travels on, you cannot see it, but it's there. And then from there, just keep going. It's nice and easy. Yeah? Nice and easy. Islam. I mean, even we, in Islam, we have etiquettes how to use a cell phone. Don't you hate it when someone's really loud on the phone, or someone's doing this, or someone touches your phone? And do in Islam, that's not a lot. Islam. Let me tell you about Islam. Khalas, it's easy. Come on, another one. Yes. Uh, very good. Connecting people, silatul arham, loving each other. Bam, cell phone. Okay, now something else, another topic. Tough one. Well, there's no such tough one. You will see everything can be back to Islam. What else? The weather, so easy. Forget weather. Huh? What else? <laughs> hey, it rains here. Oh, there's a dua in Islam for right now. <laughs> we're, we're done with that. Why? And let me explain. Huh? Some, anything? <laughs> I think the link is easy there, right? Isn't it? Homosexuality, isn't the link easy? You know? And you can make it, you doesn't, it doesn't have to be a rough conversation. You can make it a, uh, what do you call it? Um, you can make it intellectual, you know? Like people claim that it's an illness, that you're, bo I'm sorry, that you're born that way, that it's a gene, even though science found no gene. And actually, according to a lot of religions, they don't believe that it's okay. In the Quran, Allah says that Allah, Allah indicates that He does not, create a people a certain way and then condemn them for how he created them so that it tells us this verse this is in surah al-a'raf yani, and it tells us that it's no way that allah created them gay and then condemned them for being the way he created them so that wouldn't be fair of god and god is described that he's just i'm talking about islam already yes did you have a suggestion yes no, natural, disasters. natural disasters very easy link right very easy link ibtilaat difficulties uh, uh, calamities that people go through, this all it's clear link to Allah. And you, you can explain the disaster to him, put it in a light that he can understand, for example, from an Islamic perspective. Because a lot of times non-Muslims, they don't understand the will of Allah and the decree of Allah. Yani they think, 
<laughs> because there was a shooting in an American school and there was a priest and he was saying, this is not God's will. He, he means, yani, <laughs> he means that Allah doesn't want that. But he's confused between what Allah wants and what Allah allows to happen. So you can explain it to him. Put the pers Islamic perspective on calamities. End of story. Okay, last one. Yes? Sorry? The, the <laughs> one person, the Lord of the Rings. How do you go from the Lord of the Rings to... Uh, I haven't seen it, so you have to do this one now. I just know that there's this horrible skinny naked guy <laughs> all the time. That's all. Every time I see a clip of it, it's ah! So, but anyways, I haven't seen it. But yalla, you who have seen it, tell me. Yes. It's okay, here is where your sister jumps in. And who created Australia? <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, she sings, she'll, she's the Lord of the Ring was shot in Australia. Fine, you can go from there. You, you want to, yes? There's a character in Lord of the Rings, it's the eye, just one eye. So uh -huh. you can connect it to Dajjal. Oh, oh ho ho. And now he's saying that there's a character in the, in the Lord of the Rings called the eye. And from there go to the Dajjal. I don't know about the Dajjal as a da'wah thing. You know? There's something coming, he's one eye. He will travel the earth. Really? Is this the second Lord of the Rings movie? or what is this? Okay, but good. Uh, but does the eye in the movie watch people? Okay, so instead of the Dajjal, go from the ever watchful eye to the ever watchful eye of. And the ever watchful Allah. Yeah? Yeah? Khalas, it's a simple link. Yeah? So you get the idea? The point is when you want to talk about something, you will find a way from the strangest topic to talk about that thing. All right? So, Barakallahu Feekum, thank you all for coming. Wait before you start shuffling off. Go out and try. Okay? Even if it doesn't work, at least now for sure you know it doesn't work. Versus just being someone who's like, it's not going to work. But try it. If it, you fail, then try again, by the way. Be like your Prophet وسلم, who tried constantly Nuh for 950 years. Do we have announcements? Yes, we do have something. Yeah? Okay, you guys. You guys enjoyed this? You, you guys typically enjoy and benefit from the things that iMuslim puts forward? Would you like more things to continue, inshallah? Yeah. And more lessons and more speakers? Or would you rather like, like tomorrow they, sh they shut down, may Allah forbid? <laughs> yeah. So this is part of then of our responsibility when we want the khair to continue. Uh, the khair comes at a price. It doesn't come for free, you know. Renting buildings comes at a price. Printing notes comes at a price. Bringing people over, flying people, getting people just for, even if they live in the city, bringing them to, everything comes at a price. So we have to, it's very important that as a community we learn that for whatever is beneficial, we have to support it and we have to like do something for it to continue existing. Yeah? And this is what the Prophet used to teach the companions. Give and donate to the army. Give and donate to the masjid. Give and donate to the poor. Give and fix this problem. So now, I'm going to bring this up. Or how are we going to do this Malaysian way or American way? You know? Is, is this Malaysian or, or American? Malaysian? Okay. So we're, <laughs> we're going to do this. Yeah. On your way out, let me see. can you hold that box? Hold it nice up. Yes. You see this box here? We want this box when we leave to be stuffed with paper. Not any paper now. It's paper with certain colors and certain numbers on it, yeah? And this, this is going to go straight to things like this, yeah? For events for you, yeah? And in the best organizations are you give the money and you see what it does for you later on. It's not going to go somewhere. And that's, the, that's the idea. So as you leave, Prophet said, do not belittle any of the good deeds. If all you have in your pocket is one ringgit, don't belittle it. You don't know where it's going to end up, inshallah. So everybody put something in that box on your way out. Barakallahu feekum, barakallahu for the organizers. It was wonderful. I have to leave tomorrow. I don't want to leave Malaysia. I have to leave tomorrow. I'm going to miss all of you guys. It was great. And I always, always, one second, one second. I always, always finish all my lectures and all my courses by saying the following. Are you with me? Look, I always like to joke around 
Sometimes the jokes, I, they just come naturally even. I don't write them and prepare them to say, say this here. They just come naturally. So we're just trying to have fun while we're learning the religion of Allah Azza So if anything I said, if any of the jokes offended you or hurt your feelings in any way, get over it. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum.